Welcome into this edition of This Week in UNC Baseball with Head Coach Scott Forbes. I'm Tommy Ashley. That's Greg Snugent. We are sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity. Coach Forbes, uh, Grace wrote an article that was on our website earlier today. A character win helped you get out of that weekend up in Charlottesville with some positive vibes. Just sort of talk about your team's ability to battle back there. Yeah, no doubt. You know, we've always talked about here how important the Sunday game is, um, not taken away from Friday or Saturday. But on Sunday, one of three things happens. You have a chance to sweep, you have a chance to win the series, or you have to prevent from getting swept. And there haven't been many seasons at UNC, even on the teams that went to Omaha, where we haven't had those important Sundays. And those teams found a way – to get one when they had to. That doesn't mean we weren't swept at all during those years because we were. Um, But that's, you know, I haven't read the article yet, Grace, but that is a great statement from the standpoint of it even showed me a lot. You know, we're up 6 nothing, and you're feeling pretty good, and then you blink and it's 6-6 to again after, you know, losing a six-run lead on Thursday. Um, it showed a lot about our guys. It didn't really surprise me because I've been around this group. I mean, I know how they are. Um, but, yeah, it was, a, it was a good win for us, just like the Sunday at Miami, a totally different series. Um, but that was, a, that was a big win for us, and that's a tough place to win. What was the sort of difference for you on Saturday versus Thursday and Friday? Uh, Friday game was a little different, but, but Thursday they jump on Folger early. You, you take that lead. What sort of was the difference between Thursday's effort and Saturday's effort as far as being able to hold it? Was it Poston doing his job or? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously I felt good about it. We went for it on Thursday um, because, you know, Coach Fox and I talk all the time. If we did a study the last 25 years in the ACC of whoever wins the first game and the percentage of that team winning the series, I bet it's 85 90%. Because a lot of people say, oh, save your best guy for game two. I don't think that's the case because if you get that momentum, it helps you tremendously um, and the pressure goes in the other dugout, especially if you win on the road on on that game one. Because at home, obviously, you're supposed to win. Um, I think the biggest difference was we answered offensively. Um, you know, when we went up 11-5, to five, I think that was in the third, they put up goose eggs the rest of the game, a bunch of zeros. Well, they come back and they tie it, and then Parks Harvey hits a home run. Luke Stevenson hits a home run. Obviously, there's some things we need to clean up defensively and on the mound on that first game, but I still feel like if we punch back in like the fifth or the sixth and we get a run here, a run there, I think we find a way to win that game. And that's a credit to their bullpen, but I feel like our, our the quality of our bats, you know, maybe we were in a little bit of shock that they tied it after being up 11-5, to five, and we learned from that on Saturday and – didn't you know didn't make it a big deal and we and we answered but posting obviously was extremely good um you know that's that's a as good offensive work as we're going to face all year one of the top if not the top top to bottom in the country and i think we're right up there with them um but you know i felt like posting did a really good job once we got that lead of, of equalizing them pretty pretty quickly his stuff was good Looking back to that Thursday game, Coach, what do you say to your team after they score 11 runs? Because normally 11 runs would win you the ball game, yeah. but it didn't in that case. You know, the more I do it, the, the less I talk after a loss. Um, you know, you have to know the, the pulse of your team. And this team wants to win so badly, they were they were ticked. And so really with this team, I just remind them, hey, you know, flush it just like you would have flushed if we'd have walked them off, you got to move on and be ready to play the next day. Um, and you can't get caught up in you win as a team and you lose as a team. You can't have the separation of, oh, we, you know, the offense scored 11 runs and the pitchers gave up 14 runs and the pitchers got to pitch better. It's, it's a team game. You pick each other up. And there were some plays that game, too, that if we make defensively, it makes it easier on our pitchers. And you can't give extra outs to teams like Virginia or us offensively because you know we're gonna we're gonna capitalize on that. So I just told the guys, hey, once you take that, once you get off this bus, take that shower, we'll have our post game meal. Uh wake up tomorrow and it's a new day and we'll go to work. Looking at those two games with Folger and Shea, what kind of goes into your decision to pull 
your starting pitcher. Because, I mean, we'll see all the numbers, the balls, the strikes, the walks, but what do we don't see that'll go into those decisions? Yeah, a lot of it, you know, a great example is Folger, cold, really cold. Um, he had a really good second inning, but his first inning really taxed him. He threw a lot of pitches. He's at 50 pitches after two. He's a young kid. And that, you know, we scored six runs, and that, that inning was almost 42 minutes. And I just felt like, man, he set that long in this type of weather. Um, you know, other guys are rested. We felt really good about going to Aiden right there, and our plan was to go Aiden, Maddie, Pence, Poston, you know, divide it up, and we didn't get it done that way, unfortunately. But we felt good about it. Um, and I just felt like that was the right decision at the time for Folger um, and his arm. It's a long season. And, and I had confidence in sending them back out there. Sprague, you know, it just depends on where our bullpen is. He's arguably been, arguably been as good as anybody. Um, but any lineup, you know, the percentages, they just don't lie. You got to go with your gut and what you see. And sometimes you're going to stay with them over what those numbers tell you. But the third time through the lineup, the averages usually don't lie. Like you've got to really be having your stuff. You got to be to show them different stuff. That's the hardest time to get through. So once we get to that point, you know, if our bullpen's fresh and as good as our bullpen is, unless that starter is really throwing well, which Shea was doing against Georgia Tech, you you make a change most of the time. Coach, when you so you know as well as I do, from a fan perspective deciding who to put in the game pitching is always the biggest thing. Yeah. People are going to say, well, what's he doing this for? When you, I know you like to go matchup based a lot when, when you um, put relievers in, but how, at what point is it my guy's better than that guy, regardless of whatever the matchup says? Yeah, that went, that always wins out for me, Tommy, from the standpoint of being a pitching coach so much. It's like if the hitter is, he's really good on a fastball, and he's facing Dalton Pence, and it's a big situation. Dalton Pence is throwing a fastball. So may the best man win because you don't want to lose with your second best pitch unless, you know, if it's Michael Moore back in the day, he's throwing a changeup. So, you know, you do match up, but your matchups aren't always what people think. You know, just because the left-handed hitter doesn't mean Kyle Percival is coming in to face that guy because Kyle Percival in the season has been really good against righties and hasn't been as good against lefties. Whereas a guy like Matt Poston, yes, he's right-handed, but he's been really good against lefties. So for us, for me, it's always the best pitcher is going to win out over the matchup. So if like Matt Poston's available, and I don't care who's up, if he's available to close the game, most likely I'm going with him, even if we have a lefty that matches up really good with lefties, even if it's five lefties in a row because we believe in Matt. When you put him in – on Saturday, I believe you put him in the sixth inning, which, yeah. was, which was early. It, probably the earliest we've seen him, maybe. I, I don't know. I'd have to look, and you would know. But did you did you think he could go, I guess, three and a third, what he ultimately did? Or, or did you hope, or where were you there? Yeah, you know, I felt like it was the biggest point of the game. We could not let them take the lead. Madera arguably made the biggest play of the game, keeping that ball from going to the outfield and them taking the lead. And then Matt struck out the next hitter. He had not pitched. He had had five days rest, I believe. He pitched on Saturday, Sunday against Wake. So we had five days. So I looked at it like this kid, I've seen enough to know that he recovers great. And if he's in the zone, he could throw 100 pitches. That's just kind of how he's built. He's a big kid. And my hope was he could finish the game. But I wasn't worried about that at the time. I was like, okay, this is the most important part of this game. If they go up nine to six, you know, that momentum's really going to be in that dugout. We got to keep it right here. It worked out for us. When it comes to lineups, similar to when you're choosing when to put in your relievers, you've changed your lineup around a little bit in the past few weeks. And you told me after Saturday's game that you don't care if the team is up. It just depends on who you think should go where in that lineup. How do you decide – this guy's leading off today. This guy's going to hit two hole. This guy's going to get three hole. How? What is the kind of the thought process that goes into that, especially when the team is? Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, some guys are hot, some are not. But, you know, usually about this point of the season, you have a good idea who you want to be in that top five, top six, who you want to get up there as much, and who you want the other team to have to face as much. But you're also looking at different things at this point of the year, Grace, from on-base percentage, 
walks to strikeouts. Um, and I learned a valuable lesson personally in 2013. I wasn't the head coach, but going back and reevaluating, we were so good that year, we hardly ever lost. We didn't lose two games in a row. And when you lose, you reevaluate everything. It's just nature. It's like, okay, what do we have to do? What do we have to change? And after that year, I said to myself, you know, I want to do the same thing when we win. I want to look at it like after every game, how can we get better? And not be afraid to make a change if it will make us better. You know, you go back, I think it was 2018, we started leading off Kyle Datris and we were in a winning streak. We felt like that was better for our overall lineup. In 2019, we went Bush Sabato. And that's kind of how I've been feeling a little bit about getting D'Onofrio at the top because he had not hit as many home runs as I thought he would, but he led our team in walks. He has the least amount of strikeouts. And I thought, okay, Vance has a knack for driving in runs. Obviously, Parks is coming along. And then Casey Cook's RBIs speak for themselves. So if we can get D'Onofrio at the top, a harder guy to strike out, his own base percentage is up. That gets us a base runner with speed right away. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, and then, you know, once you get to that six through nine, you're, you're, you're just going best, 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 best uh, based on where they are in the season. I don't believe in leaving a guy like Kobe Wilkerson's had a great year, but if we need to move him to seven, I'll move him to seven. I'm not going to leave him to nine just because he's hitting well. You know, that's that's not the way it should work. Speaking about D'Onofrio, Vance, you brought up Madera, all those crazy outfield defensive plays those stopping the ball from getting to the outfield, the plays that you're not exactly going to see that change the game on the stat sheet, but yeah. just how valuable, especially in that outfield, back-to-back -back sliding catches, Vance, D'Onofrio, just how valuable is that to have, especially with a younger starting pitching rotation? I mean, if you really look at baseball now and how pitchers really are trying to gain velocity and pitch at the top of the zone, they're more fly balls. And if you don't have a good outfield in today's game, it will bite you big time. Almost as much as not being not having a good infield, if not equally. Um, as a matter of fact, I think there are more balls, you know, fly ball outs in college baseball almost now than ground ball outs against the elite competition. So we're lucky. We feel like we have one of the best outfields. Um, you know, they they have made plays that, like you said, they don't go. If you make an error on the dirt, you know, everybody talks about you got to clean up your defense but they don't talk about how many balls you're getting to in the outfield. <clears throat> like a little play like Casey Cook made in game three at, on Sunday at Wake. You know, yeah, we're up four, but if that leadoff hitter gets on in that ballpark, they can have the time run to the plate in a second. So that's been – you know, that's why it's hard to get in our outfield. Those are three really good outfielders, um, and they've played unbelievable defense for us, no doubt about it. I agree with you that the outfield defense is special, and I think we wrote about it way in the preseason. I said, yeah. we said outfield good, possibly elite. So, um, toot, toot and horns. It's definitely elite. <laughs> definitely elite. Let me ask you about D'Onofrio, though, in another way. 491 feet, really? I mean, that's what they said, but I knew when it was hit, I was like, man, that is a bomb. And – We've seen him hit them in BP here. Like, we're like, I hope field hockey's not practicing today. <laughs> and he, we saw it on video when we recruit him at Quinnipiac. And I think they're going to come in bunches. But he's also worked really hard at driving the ball all over the field and becoming more of a complete hitter uh, with that speed. So I think the, now that he's starting to figure that out a little bit, that he can do both, hopefully that's going to continue to surge. And I love having a guy at the top that will take a walk, but also can hit a home run. Um, puts a lot of pressure on the defense. When I heard the announcer say, that's 490 feet later, I was, no, that, no way. In the cold at Virginia, but I guess. It looked, numbers... like it, it looked like it would have got somebody down there on the track field, didn't it, Grace? <laughs> so it was, that thing was far gone. Yeah, it was, it was, it was hit. Uh, if, if you had D'Onofrio, like in the article earlier today, if you had D'Onofrio for the, Longest home run of the season on the bingo card. You probably should have played the lottery the other day. Uh, There's no doubt. I thought Vance went, you know, the one he hit the center was a long ways too. Um, but, you know, it's a fun team because, you know, throughout the lineup, I even think a guy, you know, 
like Madera, like he's still – he's got such great bat speed and he's still working so hard to get the ball in the air. I think he's capable of hitting some in some big situations. Let me ask you a couple a couple things about sort of the nature of college baseball. And, and we're talking about home runs. Um, do you think there's more this year? It, I don't know comparison year by year, but it seems like the ball is flying out of the park, not just for Carolina but for other teams. And it kind of goes in cycles over the course of the seasons across the country. Do, do you yeah. sense that this year? Yeah, the, you're not seeing many, you know, earn run average of like 2.8 anymore. And I think the biggest reason is the zones with track man are, are small and you're not getting as many pitches. So hitters are getting more pitches to hit. And then the ball, obviously, when they changed it to the lower seam, the ball is, is harder um, and it's going to have higher exit velocities. I mean, the bats are not like they were. 06, 07, 08, those years, early 2000s. But the ball was such a, a high seam ball, it didn't carry like this one. And, and I know it's Grace's turn, but I'm going to follow with it because you mentioned track man, and I wanted to, to sort of figure out what's going on. A lot of folks complain about balls and strikes. That's, a, that's the nature of the beast as well. And you, we've talked about track man, and you talk about how umpires are graded. How exactly does that work? Game to game, series to series, um, is, is that a thing where guys are looked at game to game, yeah. or is it something? You, you know, know what? I think it's great for baseball um, because we're all held accountable. Mm-hmm. You know, you're held accountable for the jobs y'all are doing. And umpires have jobs. They get paid. They're awesome guys, but, you know, they're the judge and the jury always have been, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, you can't argue all the strikes, and and that's okay. But when you have a job to do behind the plate, you got to be pretty good at it. I mean, this is a really high level baseball. And now with Trapman and having a buffer zone that they've come up with in the ACC and the SEC, you know, you might can give a little bit of ball off, but if you're giving two off, you're giving three off, and you're really inconsistent, you're, you know, you're great in zone and out of zone accuracy. So if you're calling end zone strike strikes, you're good, right? But if you're calling end zone strikes balls, you're not good there. And if you're calling out of zone, Strike pitches, strikes that are way out of the zone. Your percentages are going to drop. And as a as a coaching community, we're we're all saying, okay, we feel like these guys should be around that ninety percent. They're not going to be perfect. Obviously, major league umpires are the elite. Um, but you know, at this level, if you're getting into that 80, 82, 83, 84 percent, you got to do better. And that's the cool thing now is I'm going to know right after the game. You know, I try not to say too much. I don't think my eyes lie to myself that much. But the the longer you coach, the less it it doesn't do a lot of good to get on an umpire unless it's really bad and you're sticking up for your guys. But when you have that home plate meeting, I know, okay, Tommy Ashley was 82%. And, you know, you're down there at third base that day, I might be like, hey, Tommy, man, like, we got to do better. Like, you know, that I, I got on you a little bit. Well, here's why I got on you. You know, that three two pitch to Vance Honeycutt, he can't hit it. You know, Casey Cook is going down looking three baseballs off the plate, but you also have to be careful and because then you can think that it's maybe not great and you get it as 95%. So you have to choose your words wisely. But I love it. I love it from the standpoint of <clears throat> if you want to give a little bit off fine, but do you know be good. Be good and be professional. Pivoting from stats kind of showcased in Saturday's game, and we've talked about it, the team is going to play 27 outs. And a ton of the guys have talked about how this team really feels, it feels like a family. They're playing ping pong in the clubhouse. They're just really enjoying their time with one another. How do you think that kind of familial aspect translates positively to the field, especially with just all of the depth and all of the returning players that have had to kind of take to the bench this year? Yeah, I mean, you know, if there's one thing that you want to try to do as a coach is you want to make everybody that's on your team have a great experience. It doesn't mean they're all going to play. Um, but they should have a great experience here from the standpoint of they know they're going to be treated well, they're going to be treated with respect. It's a positive environment. It's a, it's a, I know this sounds corny, but it's a. we care about our kids. And I tell them all the time, you know, like this is a place that you're loved. And we use that word. There's tough love. But I want this place to be the place you look forward to the most every single day. Whatever you have going on off the field, classroom, 
doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. Um, but we've, we've worked even harder about making these kids understand like how fast it goes and to enjoy like today, like don't let a loss to so-and-so ruin, you know, don't come in here negative. And that, that starts with me, number one, obviously, um, and our coaches. So we have to practice what we preach and, uh, you know, basically here, I just tell our guys, like, you know, we're going to practice hard. We're going to lift hard. We're going to work hard. I expect you to do things a certain way here, but the game is yours. And, you know, I don't I don't want them to play tight. I don't want them to, you know, if they're, if they're always showing effort, like you said, playing 27 outs, that's what we talk about. Like, if there's a mark of your team besides the fundamental stuff and you want it to be like, you have to beat this team. Like, it doesn't matter how many punches you, you hit them or they're, they're going to – play until that last out is made and then if you do that as a player as a coach you you, you know you take a shower and you feel good look yourself in the mirror you may not be happy because you lost but it creates a really good environment that's a credit to the players too and to our assistant coaches that work so hard on the road recruiting these kids because you know that you want good kids they're not perfect but we put a high emphasis on trying to find kids that come in here and understand that if, if it's if it's if it gets to where you're above the team this is not going to be the place for you and then at i think that is a great thing they all seem to really really love one another and love playing on that field together you can see it from the press box every day looking at we're around the mid-season point especially brought in a ton of freshman arms especially folger olin jason those guys that have started and you know, the phrase you graduate at some point, you got to graduate from being a freshman into being a sophomore, but there can also sometimes be that, that freshman wall. How have you seen those guys really evolve over this first half of the season? Yeah. Like I tell them, no, no, absolutely not. There's no freshman wall. There's a freshman wall. If you're, if you're not taking care of yourself, you know, you made the decision to play at the highest level of college baseball. So you got to make the decision when you leave here, to eat good, to sleep good, to get your lifting in, to get your post in. You know, you might have 20 family members waiting on you, but after the game, you got to get in there and get your running in. You got to get your arm care in. You got to get your treatment in. Then go eat with your family. Um, but, you know, you, you just have to trust what your strength coaches are doing, your nutritionists are doing. Our, our training staff's unbelievable. You know, Terry Joe leads the way there. And we do take a lot of pride here. I tell our guys, like, we want to go up. We want the velocity to increase. We want our bat speed to be the best, even when it's, you know, if we're fortunate enough to be in Omaha, we don't want slow bats. We don't want to be running, you know, low. We want to be continuing to climb. And that's where, too, I, you know, I feel like we've gotten better as coaches of understanding, like, sometimes rest is good. You know, it's hard. Like, you want to practice, 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 practice. But sometimes a lighter practice or just hitting in the cages or saying, guys, you're not coming in today. And they look at you like, what do you mean? Like, do not. The Bosch is locked. You can come in and you can get treatment, but just don't hit today. Don't throw today. Just take one day and cook out and just be a college kid. So, you know, I don't think that's going to be something that we have to deal with. And we feel like we've done a good job. If you look at these pitch counts, you know, Shea's the only one that went pretty high against Georgia Tech. Um, we've been, you know, we've been going to our bullpen, which is older, a little bit earlier as well to try to keep an eye on that. Talking with head coach Scott Forbes here on This Week in UNC Baseball. Uh, I got asked six to $4,000 question. South Carolina, Tuesday night in Charlotte. Uh, big game. Big game for the Carolinas. Big game to sort of showcase college baseball in the Carolinas, just like your East Carolina series did earlier. Um, pitching. Everybody wants to know who's pitching. Who, who's walking out there first, Coach Forbes? Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> The bus ride back obviously was a good one because we won the game. And then I got to watch, um, you know, college basketball, college baseball. Uh, and it was a good day in college basketball. Um, you can take that however you want. But uh, did you see Roy, by the way? Have you seen the social media thing <laughs> no. of Roy? No, what's he, what's he doing? I got I got to send it to you because okay. ha- I can't describe it. I'll ruin it if I describe it. I, I'll, te- <laughs> I'll text it to you. It but is was, classic. You know, Judge Gaines is. Uh, Unfortunately, Coach Gaines' wife and little girl went to go. Um, only Wren went, but he drew. When that's the case, our coaches will drive their families back because we think that's important. And, you know, I just ride the bus back with the guys. 
but I was talking to him a little bit on the way back and I was looking at it. I was like, you know, this, it makes sense to Folger needs to pitch He threw 49 pitches. He threw two innings with a, with a kid like that. The best way for him to keep improving in his development is to go back out there. And he's one of our starters. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise because we have been considering moving to Cairo to Friday and because of the shorter week that sets up perfectly. So Folger will start. We'll keep him on a, a decent count. Um, when I say that, it all depends on how he, you know, if he throws 40 pitches in one inning, we'll have to get him out earlier than we want to. So Folger will start the game, and uh, then we're going to go to Caro on Friday, Sprague on Saturday, and then Boaz on Sunday. Uh, so, you know, I'm excited to see to see Folger in this environment. He, he pitched in it at Wake, so it'll be good for him. We'll have all of our guys ready as well. Uh, for the game. And this game is awesome. We schedule it for our fans. We schedule it for our players, most importantly, because they get to play at an unbelievable park, one one that will be in the ACC tournament, hopefully. And, you know, that's a good experience for them as well. Yeah, it, it is a beautiful park. Oh, uh, man, uh, awesome. Charlotte. It, it is unbelievable, especially at night. A um, couple of fun questions if you've got time. We've kept you longer. Yeah, I'm good. No, I'm good. Sorry I had to do it later. I was tied up a little bit this morning. No, you know we can talk all day, but I, I got to – we mentioned umpires, and you were given that third base umpire, Tommy Ashley, a hard time earlier about his strike zone. When do you know when it's time to shut up as a coach? Well, I, there are times where I haven't known. Well, a couple I times. I gone. I was watching us twice – it, it, it seems that Coastal has something for you, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna watch that. I, I'm, I'm gonna make sure. Um, <laughs> but my goal this season was not to get thrown out at all, unless it was just you know a crazy situation. Um, you know, the older you get, the more you realize even in coaching, yelling doesn't do a lot of good. Um, losing your temper doesn't do any good. Tell our guys, you know. When you control your – when you lose your temper, it's a sign of weakness. When you just kind of stay under control, um, or when you do stay under control, it's a sign of strength. So th there's really no need. There's a, You know, you can tell. You know, if you've made your point, and especially if you've been warned, if they say, hey, that's your warning with balls and strikes, if you decide to say something out after that, you can pretty much know. It's like the old whisper, like, hey, uh, coaches, just so you know, I'm getting ready to be out of this game, so y'all enjoy the rest. And that has happened, but, you know, it just depends on the situation. But Because you're always going to fight for your players. You know, I know how our players conduct themselves. They don't say a word to the umpires. They know how we do things here. They don't celebrate home runs. They play the right way. So if an umpire is that bad and it warrants it, it warrants it. The only time you're doing that, though, is if it's strictly to make your guys know, like, hey, I got your back. Now y'all just finish the game and figure out a way to win it. I know in my limited coaching experience, when that umpire throws that hand up and says, that's enough, you better be quiet or you're watching. So, so well, you, you got some umpires that will, you know, that will be, try to bait you into getting thrown out. And you have to start figuring out who those are and then not waste your time with it. Do the opposite, you know, just like just shake your head at them. So, uh, are, are you telling us in a hypothetical situation that there's been some times where you say, I'm, I'm, I'm about to be out of here, boys? Handle it, Maybe. Coach Gaines. Yeah, yeah. I'll <laughs> confess, yes. <laughs> Grace, that was you, not the case in 2022 in that regional. I can tell you that. I was just shocked as everybody else. What he did. What he, so so how did it go down? Can we get the inside know. scoop? I was getting on about the infield fly roll, and the home plate umpire threw me out, and the other umpire came flying across. I, don't even, I mean, I know I didn't curse. I know I didn't say anything derogatory, um, but I guess he thought I should have stopped saying anything, and he gave me two games. And, they're, again, judge and jury. Nothing you can do. Um, except <laughs> hope your team finds a way to win two games. Hey, I'll see y'all boys at the beach. <laughs> yeah, find a hidden spot to watch the game when nobody knows where you are. All right, Coach. I got I got another fun one for you. If right. you could catch, you were a catcher. If you could catch one major league pitcher, not a Carolina guy, who would it be, past or present? Oh, man, easy. Nolan Ryan. Well, I mean, I would try to catch him. I'd probably break my thumb in the first <laughs> time he threw a ball. Because on that documentary on Netflix, it says that his fastball would have been registered 108.5. So, like, that would have been fun to do at least once. 
it's crazy. I'm I'm from Texas, and that that warms my heart to hear you say that. Oh it's yeah, Nolan Ryan. Good. The way he carried himself, the way he—I mean, that guy. I think that's one record that uh, they say never say never, but I see it never being broken. That's never going to be broken. Guys don't pitch enough to break that. No, nope. no doubt, no doubt. We were looking at y'all love this. We were looking at Matty Mathias because he has all these wins, and we're looking at pitchers that had a bunch of wins. And Greg Norris in 1978, Coach Fox is on that team. I think he won 14 games. 13 of them he threw complete games. Think about that. I know. You look at our Bobby. starters. I was like, we don't even have one yet. I know. Can we get one? You look at like Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson back in the day, oh. just the complete game after complete game. Yeah. And uh, Grace, any more fun ones? We we got the uh, chill coach for us. We usually catch him in the morning when he's stressed. He's about to go to practice. No, I'm not, I don't come across. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But you, I might be wired up on coffee. Now yeah, that's I'm it. <laughs> I still am. You know, we survived the eclipse down here, and, and so I'm I'm jacked. Yeah, up we all coffee. went out and looked at it with the glasses today. Grace, you got anything left? No, I'm all good. I uh, I got I got another fun one. What's the worst? Nah, I'm not gonna do that. That's not nice. You put me on the spot. No, I was gonna ask uh, something, some about a player, a former player, or whatever. Not call anybody by names, but anyway. But but seriously, and let's end on a, on a serious note. Like Grace said, you're virtually in the in the middle way. Uh, I mean, college baseball seems to play a ton of games, but what's ridiculous is you play half of what pros play, which yeah is insane if you had to pick a couple things that and you never do it but i'm asking you to do it it that may, that surprised you hmm. you're in january and here we are in first week in april second week of april x has surprised coach forbes about this season thus far man um you know i would say how the freshmen have maintained what they've done. And that also includes Gavin Gallagher and Luke Stevenson. Um, Cause it's harder and harder to get on the field and stay on the field nowadays more than ever. Cause you are facing a bunch of older players and how our young pitchers, you know, for the most part, three out of four starters have been freshmen and Olin's still going to pitch a ton for us. We'll use him some probably tomorrow night at the bullpen. Um, I would say how those guys have been able to, continue to perform for us at a high level. Um, and then I would say the, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, I guess, but you don't know until you go through it is how awesome our kids that, because everybody wants to play, that may have played a ton that haven't, but how awesome they've been and how much, le how quality leadership they've had. Um, so that's just so clear that they care about winning and they know if they keep working, they're probably going to be given an opportunity and they'll have, some success for sure yeah that, it, it is you find out a lot about a baseball player or any kind of player of how they act when they're on the bench oh no doubt and, or any uh, type of adversity and you know we knew going in this last you look at wake at virginia charlotte we knew these seven games like okay that's not a cakewalk um it wouldn't be a cakewalk if it was here at the bosch but playing at home is playing at home you know how we conduct ourselves and the poise we have will have a big difference on how we do in those games because you're going to have some tougher situations, tougher environments. So I'm really proud of our guys. Obviously, you know, we'd like to get two out of three at UVA, but um, we're excited. You know, you hop back on a bus and play in a great environment. Hopefully the weather will be good tomorrow night. It should be in Charlotte. That'll be North Carolina, South Carolina, and that beautiful baseball I mean, it just absolutely. If 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 you're watching this and you've never seen a baseball game at Charlotte, go see Carolina and South Carolina, because it is worth the trip. And we'll be there for the ACC tournament, of course. Coach Forbes, anything left? I, do do you ever? And and I will say this: you're you're awesome to talk to, so Thank positive. You. And I've given you a hard time earlier, but I want to make sure I don't leave the impression that we get stressed out, Coach Forbes, because quite frankly, I've never seen you stressed out. Um, you're always positive, and it's cool to talk yeah. to. You. Try to be. Any, anything, anything left here for this week? Um, that, for, for that Thursday game and that Saturday game, 
um, were impressive in opposite ways. But Shea Sprague, is he your MVP on the mound thus far? Yeah, I mean, and that's another surprise. You asked me about a surprise. He didn't have a good preseason. Obviously, in his defense, he was shut down, hadn't thrown a lot, but he keeps getting better. His stuff keeps getting better, and he's a big-time competitor. Um, so, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> he might be one of, one of them on the mound. Even though Dalton struggled a little bit, he – Dalton and Poston and, and Matty Mathias, I mean, these guys, they're ready every day. They work. They want to pitch. You know, and there's going to be somebody else. I told our pitching staff. There's going to be some guys that haven't pitched a lot. Ben Peterson comes in and throws one really, really good inning. We know what he's capable of doing. Um, so I've been doing it long enough know, to know, like, okay, there's a there's a guy that's going to need to do something, you know, just big time for us that hasn't done much. Because you can't win a championship if that's not the case. Because you have this happen or that happen. Um, but, yeah, Shea, man, he's he's been – very consistent, and that's why we felt like we needed to move him up a day for sure. Good stuff. That's Scott Forbes. That's Grace Nugent. I'm Tommy Ashley. It's been the Inside Carolinas This Week in UNC Baseball. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to Johnny T-Shirt. Thanks to Congruity for sponsoring us. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, guys and ladies.